Good day everyone and welcome to another screencast in immunization and vaccines. I am Dr. Supachay Vasit and welcome to the session. I hope you're doing fine and let's start our lesson. For today's lesson, we shall be of course reviewing what are the different types of immunity. We shall also be delineating um, active immunization, especially when it comes to the history of vaccines vaccine types and examples, its advantages and limitations, and of course, we will actually review what are the factors influencing immunogenicity, and then of course, um, passive immunization will also be part of this lesson, such as its examples, its benefits and limitations, and eventually, we will also be discussing adoptive immunity. So, let us first define what do we mean by immunity. So, when we say immunity, Immunity refers to the condition of being resistant to disease. Okay? So, if you are immune, it means that you will not have that particular type of infection. So, right now, I can say that I am immune to polio. I am immune to measles, to mumps. Because when I was a kid, um, when I was a kid, um, my mom had me immunized against those infections. However, however, um, there are possibilities that say, for example, since I didn't have any booster, okay, there's a possibility that somehow there are very minute chance or little chance it becomes bigger if I become immunocompromised. I hope that won't happen. That I may get the same infection again, particularly if the immunoglobulins diminish because of the failure of getting booster. Okay, so anyway, I'm just defining immunity. Okay, immunization is the process by which immunity is acquired. Okay, so there are actually three types of immunization. Active, passive, and adoptive. Okay, so when you say, uh, it's so easy to remember between active and passive. Okay, and we will discuss adoptive later on. So when you say active, the keyword here is in active immune response. Okay, it is your immune system okay, that plays an important role for the production of antibodies. You yourself produces or produce the antibodies. Whereas when you say passive, antibodies were just given to you. Okay, advantages and disadvantages. So active immunity is much long lasting as compared to passive. Okay, however, active immunity does not have a therapeutic effect. Unlike passive, passive has, has a therapeutic effect. Excuse me, just brushing my eggs. I'm, you're not supposed to do that, okay? And then, in passive immunity, in passive immunity, passive immunity is both therapeutic and prophylactic. So, in passive immunity, antibodies were just given to you. Okay? So, there are several misnomers that we can actually uh, uh, hear or read, especially by lay people, most of them would say anti-COVID-19 vaccine. That's a misnomer because vaccine is an antigen, anti is an antibody. So you either say anti-COVID or COVID-19 vaccine. So there are some people who say anti-rabies vaccine. Again, that's wrong. Rabies vaccine, active immunization anti-rabies passive immunization okay so there so again when you say active immunization active immunization is the stimulation of a person's own immune system to mount an adaptive immune response to a particular antigen so there are actually two possible ways of doing it you can either have a natural active and the other one is artificial active. Okay, so when does natural active occurs? Natural, uh, well, may I rephrase the question? When does natural active occur? Okay, natural active immunity occur whenever we are exposed to a certain infection. So whenever we are exposed to a certain infection and eventually we mount an antibodies against that particular infection. For example, you got infected with group A streptococci, so eventually you produce antibodies against group A streptococci. 
So that's an example of natural active immunity. Now, the other type of active immunity is artificial active immunity. Okay? So, when we say artificial active immunity, the most common example of this is administration of vaccine. So, for example, um, you develop immunity to measles because you've been given measles vaccine. Okay? So, that's an example of artificial active immunity. So, transfer of antibodies from an immunized host, whether humans or animals, to non-immune individuals, okay, we call it passive immunization. So, perhaps um, the, uh, the most common of which is mother to infant. However, let me tell you again, just like your active immunization, um, there are two types of passive immunization. So, first is called natural passive immunity. Okay, and the other one is artificial passive immunity. So, natural passive immunity is the, the most, of course, the, the only example that I know is transferring of mother's or maternal antibodies to fetus or infant. So, IgG via the placenta, IgA via breast milk. Remember that only IgA can pass through the placenta except for IgG. Only IgG can pass through the placenta except for the IgG2 fragment. IgA, particularly the secretory IgA, can be, can, can be passed via breast milk. Okay, artificial passive immunity, this is our hope that, of course, aside from COVID-19 vaccine, those people um, who's, uh, those people who were able to survive COVID-19, um, they are hope that they were able to produce antibodies. So, commercial, they can, this, the plasma of these people can, for example, be commercially prepared and then we can pull these human antibodies. For example, so pulled human antibodies are being used even in the past, particularly for the treatment of immunodeficiency disease. Um, uh, there are several animals that can also help in the production of, of passive immunotherapy. For example, anti-rabies okay, antibodies may come even from horse serum. Okay? So there are many ways in which commercial antibody may be prepared. Okay, all of these are examples of artificial passive immunity. Okay, how about adoptive immunization? So, in adoptive immunization, we do not transfer antibodies, but instead, we transfer cells of the immune system, particularly, or most of the time, these are the lymphocytes. So, we get lymphocytes, lymphocytes from immunized host to non-immune individual. So, for example, there was this person who lacked um, hematopoietic stem cells because, for example, he is a leukemic patient. So, when leukemic patients usually undergo high-dose irrigation or chemotherapy, so sometimes his bone marrow becomes a plastic, um, his bone marrow may, not, may no longer be capable of producing immunocompetent lymphocytes, so he becomes immunocompromised. So, we can help these people by transferring lymphocytes to them. So, that is an example of adaptive immunization. Okay, let's talk about advantages and limitations. Okay, so active immunity, of course, induces long-term pro protection. The reason why it is capable of inducing long-term protection is because of the presence of memory cells. Memory cells um, play a vital role in an amnestic response. However, you have to wait for some time before antibodies will be developed. Okay, so for example, tomorrow is your first day of internship and you'll just be immunizing yourselves with hepatitis B vaccine. You do not expect to have antibodies against HEPA B tomorrow because it will take time before antibodies are developed. Okay, unlike in passive immunity, it provides immediate protection and at the same time it can even neutralize the pathogens in your body therefore therapeutic it is thera therapeutic as well however the limitation of passive immunity is that it is temporary memory is not produced meaning there is no anamnestic response and another thing is that passive immunity can induce hypersensitivity especially if the antibodies came from animal sera. 
Okay? Um, adaptive immunity, um, it's advantage that it can transfer cell-mediated immunity. Imagine transferring an immunocompetent lymphocyte from one person to another, particularly if the patient's own cells are already depleted. However, since it comes from another person which have a different MHC restriction, remember our lesson, possible rejection of allogenic cells may occur. So, do you, do, do you get it? So, yes, it is good, but you have to think of its limitations. Okay? So, let's talk about vaccine. Okay. Vaccine is always an example of artificial active immunity. By the way, if you are actually um, watching this screencast, I'm encouraging you to read the book as well. Um, although it is... Um, already at the at the last part of the book on chapter 25 in particular um, i'm encouraging you i'm encouraging you to to read your book uh because i will be uh placing this module right after our discussion on immunoglobulins okay so vaccine is an antigen suspension derived from a pathogen and it has the ability to induce active immunity. So, it is a form of immunoprophylaxis. So, when you say immunoprophylaxis, by having yourself undergoing a process of vaccination, you are, of, of course, preventing the occurrence of a disease, okay, of healthy individuals. I say healthy because you must have a good immune system in order for you to participate in the process of immunization. So, uh, let us discuss the history of vaccines. By the way, um, alongside this module, I will also be um, including, uh, including a YouTube link regarding an animation that will walk us through the history of vaccines. During the time of ancient China, you know, Chinese, without any pun intended, okay, variolation is performed. You know how crude variolation is? Let's say, for example, someone has an active chicken pox lesion. These Chinese doctors will ask you to inhale the lesions of a person with smallpox. So you know what happens? Champa champa. It's either you have, uh, you will contract smallpox, or either you'll not contract smallpox. So you know the empirical, uh, empirical. Uh, data is actually not quite accurate so there are no assure there's no assurance that um, you will get the disease or not get the disease until come Edward Jenner who by the way is considered to be as the father of immunology in 1796 Edward Jenner used a cross reactive material from cowpox lesion to vaccinate against smallpox so if you're watching this screencast uh, I'd like you to watch the animation alongside with this module so that you'll be able to understand further what uh, the event that transpired. How did Edward Jenner discover the, the cross reaction? Okay, what do you mean by cross reaction? Okay, cowpox is caused by a vaccinia virus, smallpox is caused by variola virus. So, if you develop antibodies against cowpox virus, the antibodies that you develop against cowpox virus, since variola and cowpox came from the same virus family, uh, pox viridae, okay, the antibodies against the cowpox virus will eventually protect you against smallpox virus. So, that's cross-reaction. Hence, the term vaccine. Because the first vaccine actually develop against the vaccinia virus which is the causative agent of cow pox so from the word vaca so yung pala yung vaccine hindi yung vekenemen okay from the word vaca okay so in 1880 louis pasteur used attenuated organisms to develop vaccines against chicken cholera and traps and babies okay take note of the keyword keyword here attenuated so what do we mean by attenuated so when we say attenuated we are referring to the process of weakening okay so it says here attenuation 
will make the bacteria or virus weaken. Okay? Pinahina. By means of chemical treatment, growth at different temperatures, or repeated in vitro passage in cell culture. So these are three ways in which you can utilize the process of attenuation. Okay. So the 20th century is said to be the golden age of vaccine development. Because during the 20th century, new methods were developed for attenuation of organisms, particularly against Mycobacterium tuberculosis and against Salmonella, the causative agent of typhoid fever. And then, toxoids were also developed. Um, when you say toxoids, these are weakened toxins. Um, there is a process of, of inactivating bacterial toxins. So now you have DPT, diphtheria pertussis tetanus. And then there was also a development of attenuate there were also developments of attenuated viral vaccines against polio, measles, mumps, rubella, and varicella. And then production of glycoconjugates. So glycoconjugates is actually um, you know the cell wall of bacteria is made up of polysaccharides, and this is linked to a certain protein. Hence the term glycoconjugates. And then the first recombinant, when you say recombinant, this is genetically engineered vaccine. Okay, this was produced against hepatitis B. Hence, it is considered to be as the golden age of vaccine development. The 21st century, on the other hand, is a different story. Um, you know, because of the fake news, uh, because of many personalities here, particularly in our country, okay people became anti-vaxxer so you know um uh, in early 2018 during 2018 you know the cases of measles in our country surged up to more than 2000 times can you just imagine it because of the fear of the vaccine on the 21st century how ironic it is right okay so and because of that Okay, beyond the 20th century, there are more live attenuated vaccines, okay? Influenza, rotavirus, herpes zoster virus. There are now more multivalent glycoconjugates against pneumococcus and meningococcus. And the first vaccine was also developed against cancer. This is particularly against HPV, um, human papilloma virus. Um, because there are several strains of hepatitis of human papilloma virus that this is a genital wart that can cause cancer. The most popular of which is HPV 16 and 18. And then new technologies were developed to produce next generation vaccine. And as of this recording, um, people or pharmaceutical companies are actually rushing towards the development of COVID-19 vaccine. Let's hope and pray that they will be successful because they have to undergo phase one, phase two, phase three, and then clinical trials and so on before we can have actually the the vaccine. So the actually the record holder is the Ebola virus vaccine two years, but now I think COVID-19 vaccine is already in a fast track. Hey, let's hope and pray that COVID-19 vaccine will be sooner develop so that we can see each other face to face okay so moving on um, there are several ways of preparing vaccine in conventional or traditional vaccines so you can either use the whole organisms so in, in, in picking whole organisms either you attenuate it okay you weaken it or you inactivate it or perhaps the other way is using a subunit vaccine. So when you say subunit vaccine, you are just using part of an organism, such as toxoids, polysaccharides, glycoconjugates, purifieds, or recombinant proteins. Okay, so let's talk about attenuated vaccine. Okay, in attenuated vaccines, we are using live, but weakened viruses or bacteria they are alive but they are said to be weakened so organisms are grown under abnormal culture conditions so that they are no longer pathogenic but even if they are not pathogenic they're still alive 
Hence, they are still capable of stimulating the immune response. You know, um, even if you weaken them, you remove the virulence factor, for example, once these organisms enter your body, your immune system will still consider that as an antigen. Hence, your immune system will still be able to develop antibodies. Okay, so what are examples of live attenuated vaccine? Um, BCG, Bacillus calmitverine. Um, this actually uh, from Mycobacterium bovis, adapted to grow under high concentrations of bile, so against tuberculosis. Um, neonates, newborn infants are, are supposed to receive BCG. And then the Salmonella typhi, the mutated strains of Salmonella typhi. For viral, we have the oral polio vaccine. Um, three polio virus, so it's a trivalent oral polio vaccine. Okay, it's being given orally so that, you know, the, you know, polio virus is an example of enterovirus. So, in enteric, it's very important that mucosal immunity is induced. So, each has unique antigens that can be identified by serotyping. And then influenza vaccine is also being given by means of a nasal mist. So there are there are, there are actually two influenza A strains and two influenza type B strains that can be given by a nasal spray or nasal mist. And other examples include the MMR, rubella, measles, mumps. Oh, sorry, rubella is measles against measles. Rubella against German measles, mumps. Okay. and against varicella which, which could either be chicken pox or shingles okay so what are the advantages and limitations of live attenuated vaccines they're good um, because they, it can stimulate both humoral and cell mediated immunity immunity not to mention the oral polio vaccine may even stimulate mucosal immunity however it cannot be administered to immunocompromised patients okay because immunocompromised patients are not capable anymore of producing their own their own antibodies and sometimes um, these vaccines uh, may become opportunistic for them but in a very rare cases case right and there's also a possibility of potential interference by maternal antibodies and since these organisms are still alive therefore um, we have to be careful in handling and its storage. So it has to be at a certain ambient temperature for them. Once they are dead, then they're useless. Now, this one is uh, the, the biggest disadvantage. On rare occasion, it may revert to pathogenic form. Wow, what does it mean? Uh, you call it reversion? So let's say, for example, in receiving oral, oral pollen vaccine, um, let's say you're supposed to have antibodies against polyvirus but because of reversion because of reversion um, the person instead got infected with poliovirus and develops poliomyelitis and it happens on a very rare occasion um, some data says one in a million but what if you are that one in a million okay but anyway um Let's talk about inactivated vaccines, okay? So, when you say inactivated vaccines, these are made up of intact viruses or bacteria that have been killed. So, attenuated, they're still alive. But this one, they are already killed by treatment with chemicals or heat. So, oral polio vaccine is an example of Sabine. Intramuscular polio vaccine is an example of Salk. Okay, nasal mist is an example of live in that live attenuated vaccine. Intramuscular or intradermal influenza vaccine is an example of inactivated vaccine. Okay, uh, another example is against hepatitis A. Okay, advantage: it can be safely given to immunocompromised individuals since the organisms are already dead. It can stimulate humoral immunity, but little or no cell mediated immunity. No mucosal immunity as well for the self-vaccine. So, 
it may also require two or more booster doses to produce protective immunity so that the level of the IgG titer would become very high as well. Okay, so let's talk about the subunit vaccines. Um, in subunit vaccines, there are one or more purified components of a pathogen. Okay, so examples are toxoids, polysaccharides, purified proteins, and recombinant proteins. Okay, so let's talk about toxoids. So when you say toxoids, um, you chemically inactivate bacterial toxins. Therefore, it is known um, that are not pathogenic. So you chemically inactivate bacterial toxins that are not pathogenic. So since they are not any more pathogenic, you retain their ability to stimulate an immune response. So against the teratoxins, that's possible. Against tetanus toxins, that is also possible. Okay, polysaccharide is another example of subunit vaccine. Here, um, you biochemically purified polysaccharide from bacterial capsule. Okay, so streptococcal pneumonia, particularly the type 13 or the type 23. Okay, so 13 or, uh, sorry, I'm not referring to type, but there are about 13 or 23 serotypes of streptococcal pneumonia. And then um, the HIV, okay, because the type B capsule of Haemophilus influenzae is the most virulent. And then against the capsule of Neisseria meningitis, um, this vaccine is also present. Okay, so it requires conjugation to a carrier protein, hence the term glycoconjugates, to induce IgG production and long-term immunity. Okay, so there you have it, the polysaccharides, the polysaccharide vaccines. And then the purified proteins, um, biochemically purified components of a certain microorganisms. So pertussis vaccine. So it's against Bordetella pertussis, which is the positive agents of whooping cough. So the purified proteins or the pertussis contains about two to five purified proteins from Verdatola pertussis, including the pertussis. And then recombinant proteins are proteins produced by genetically modified non-pathogenic bacteria, yeast, or other cells. Okay, so we have an example is hepatitis B, human papilloma virus. It cannot be used to produce antigen or it cannot be used to produce antigens other than proteins. Okay. So, what are the advantages of subunit vaccine? Um, it can induce an immune response to the pathogenic components of microorganisms. At the same time, it is safe because you do not anymore administer the entire or the whole organism, the whole impact organism. You just use a particular component. Okay, so that's the advantage of a subunit vaccine. Limitation, um, just like your your killed or inactivated vaccine, it requires two or more booster doses to produce protective immunity. And at the same time, it requires an adjuvant to increase immunogenicity. So later on, we will be discussing what an adjuvant is. And it must be multivalent if a broad immune response is desired. So let's talk about the dosage. Uh, no, sorry, let's talk about the factors influencing immunogenicity. First, the age. So, if you give vaccine to the youngest individuals at the risk for at give vaccine to the youngest individuals at risk for the disease, as long as it is safe and effective for that age group. Okay. I have here an example of the baby book. Okay, this is the baby book of Josiah Carlo and. And here, uh, they have, uh, this is the copy of the different vaccination schedule. So, for example, um, it says here, um, Josiah Carlo is supposed to receive BCG, hepatitis B, DTP, and then several boosters, poliomyelitis, and then several boosters. Hemophilus influenzae, several boosters, oral rotavirus, pneumococcal. But, ang dami pang pagdadaanan because he has yet to receive. Ang hirap bumili ng oral polyvaccine pala. Ang meron lang siya yung self. 
and then influenza so there are five and then the MMR there are two varicella two hepatitis A two typhoid and others hopefully sumama na rito yung uh, COVID-19 vaccine okay so you know um, it's very uh, the reason why um, when you undergo vaccination so you have to get the sticker because in the sticker um, you'll see the lot number expiration lot number okay so mura lang naman every time you visit the pediatricians it is 11,000 10,500 uh, 11,500 anyway um libre lang naman yung ibang vaccine sa ano sa health center but we opted to go um to to his pediatrician so if you want to know more about the vaccination scheduling um uh, you cannot click this because it's actually um uh, this is actually a video file, but in your book, particularly on page 463, you'll be able to find the schedule of both child, adolescent, and adult vaccines. Yon. So this will be also be included in the exams. Okay. So another factor is the immune status. So in immune status, this refers to the degree of host immunocompetence. So it can be influenced by many factors such as age and health of the host. And then of course, the vaccine composition, whether you are, we are referring to the live attenuated vaccines. Okay, so the live atten attenuated tend to be most immunogenic as compared to the subunit vaccine because they tend to be the least immunogenic. Okay. Now, let's talk about the adjuvants. Adjuvants are substances that can enhance the immune response when administered together with a vaccine antigen. So, it makes the immune response enhanced or more efficient. So, adjuvants can stimulate the innate immune system in order to induce release of cytokines that activate adaptive immunity. So, in adjuvants, um, there are several factors to consider. One is how will you deliver the antigen? Because in antigen delivery system, okay, it can enhance the uptake of antigens by antigen presenting cells. So that's the purpose of adjuvants. Um, your antigen can easily be seen by the APCs such as the monophages, dendritic cells, mast cells, etc. Okay, adjuvants serves as immunopotentiators because it can activate as well the dendritic cells to present antigen to the T cells. Okay, so so these are the advantages of using adjuvants. So examples are alum or oil in water emulsion. So this is an example of Freund's complete and incomplete adjuvants. So whenever we are using adjuvants, there is it result in a faster, longer lasting immune response. Increase it can increase antibody titers, increase the cell mediated immunity and reduce the dose of antigen and the number of inoculations needed. So that's the reason why some of the pharmaceuticals with most of the time include adjuvants. So how about the next generation vaccines? So the next generation vaccines are called the new vaccine designs because this particular type of vaccination has actually identified potent antigen vaccine antigens by molecular methods so they use reverse engineering um, reverse vaccinology so in reverse vaccinology um, they screen first the entire genome so they sequence first the entire genome to, to identify the genes that code for good vaccine antigens this is what they're doing for COVID-19 they need to sequence first the entire genome of the virus so that they'll be able to target the gene of that particular virus so they try to induce broadly the neutralizing antibodies the next generation vaccines also involve discovering new adjuvants and then try different routes of vaccine delivery i've read an article where they even use bacteriophages in vaccine delivery and new and utilization of new methods to assess immunity okay so what's the benefits of vaccines Anti-vaxxers, please watch this, okay? Vaccines are considered to be as one of the greatest medical achievements of the 20th century. Because of the vaccination, 
there has been reduction or elimination of many serious potentially fatal diseases. Um, vaccines during the olden days, they um, previously we have declared during the time of Juan Caviar, we declared that Philippines is polio free. But unfortunately, there has been re-emergence of polio patients. Vaccines have also developed into decreased morbidity and mortality. Many infants died of measles because of these anti-vaxxers, because of this, of this um, false vaccine scare. And then, most importantly, community or herd immunity. This is what we want to develop in COVID-19. We want to develop herd or herd immunity. Protection is extended to nearby persons who have not been immunized. This is what we want to achieve. So, how does it happen? Okay. So, let's say for this is the case of COVID-19. No one is immunized yet. Okay? Since no one is immunized yet, contagious disease spreads throughout the population. This is what is happening right now all over the world. This results to pandemic. But if there are only few individuals who have been immunized, let's say a country cannot afford cannot afford to vaccinate the entire population, some of the population gets immunized. Contagious disease spreads through some of the population, but not as intense as the first one, but still it spread, still spread because you only immunize few populations. However, if most of the population gets immunized, this is what we want to achieve in our battle against COVID-19, most of the people get immunized and the spread of contagious disease is contained. So, this is what we want to achieve. Herd immunity, okay? However, um, anti-vaxxers are actually banking on this because admittedly, there are adverse effects of some vaccines. One, local reactions, swelling, swelling and tenderness at injection site. It's actually painful. Generalized reactions, low-grade fever, malay, weakness, and sever severe reactions are rare. Take note, rare. Allergic reactions, either develop type 1 hypersensitivity reaction okay, or type 3. Type 1 is acute, type 3 is is actually immune complex so you know we have another discussion on hypersensitivity reaction and development of disease this happens when you administer live attenuated vaccine remember um reversion that's one advantage that's very rare but another thing that could possibly happen is that when live attenuated vaccine is accidentally given to immunocompromised individuals okay so at, at this juncture or at this context i'd like to say that yes vaccine is important it is necessary but it may not be for everyone an example of that everyone is those people who are immunocompromised but there are other options instead of giving them life attenuated then maybe we can give them uh, killed or inactivated vaccines Whew. so let's talk about passive immunity so when you say passive immunity um, this refers to the transfer of preform antibodies to an unimmunized host. So antibodies were just given to you. It can occur naturally or through administration of therapeutic agents. So passive immunity uh, may be naturally transferred by natural passive, such as IgG through the placenta or IgA via the breast milk. However, some of them are commercially prepared. Okay, so they may come from human, such as the standard human immune serum globulin or the HISG. So these are gamma globulin. So, you know, you collect sera from thousands of donors. It contains antibodies to numerous antigens. Okay, so because there are some people who are genetically unable to produce antibodies, such as patients with SCID, severe combined immunodeficiency, those infants who live in a in a inside a capsule, okay, all throughout his life. So these individuals are supposed to receive the standard human immune serum globulin. Okay, um, there are even some um, specific for specific human immune serum globulins. 
made from pulled serum of donors with immunity to a particular pathogen, such as anti-HEPA A, anti-HEPA B, anti-chicken pox, anti-rabies, anti-tetanus, respiratory syncal virus, okay, anti-RSV. Okay, let me give you an example why is it necessary. For example, um, you were beaten by a rabid dog. So if, if rabies vaccine shall be given to you, it will take time before antibodies are produced. But you need to neutralize the rabies virus right away before it ascends into your CMS. So before it ascends to your CMS, because at that point, that is already the point of no return, this anti-rabies, okay, the antibodies will supposed to neutralize the rabies virus. Therefore, the virus shall no longer ascend to your CMS. Okay? It is used to treat an immunized individual who have potentially been exposed to a certain pathogen. Okay. Animal globulins are usually prepared from horse serum. Okay? Um, it is an antitoxin. Uh, so, for example, antibodies against bacterial toxins, against tetanus, against diphtheria, against botulism, or it can also be an anti-snake venom. So they can neutralize toxins or venom to prevent harm to humans or hosts. Uh, remember monoclonal antibodies? Okay, monoclonal antibodies are our vaccine, or uh, sorry, not vaccine, but antibodies. Let me go back. Monoclonal antibodies are antibodies produced by a single clone of each cell, directed against a particular epitope of an antigen. So it is used to treat cancer, autoimmune diseases, and other disorders. So it is also hoped that we develop already um, uh, monoclonal antibodies against COVID-19. Okay, so uh, we can we can actually know uh, the origin of monoclonal antibodies by looking at the prefix. The prefix OMAB means it came from mouse. ZMAB it is chimeric. Zumab, it is humanized. Umab means it is it is from humans. More about this, um, to know more about this monoclonal antibodies, um, please refer to page 469 of your book. Okay. So, what are the benefits of passive immunization? Passive immunization provides immediate immunity. For example, a person who receive a puncture wound containing potentially contaminated soil but who was not up to date with tetanus vaccination because you know clostridium tetany can produce um, tetanus toxins again it's a point of no return so before the onset of the symptoms you need to have anti-tetanus immediately not tetanus vaccine because it will take time before you produce antibodies against the tetanus toxin so you need to receive anti-tetanus antibodies immediately okay it can be used also as an immunosuppress as immunosuppressive therapy in selected situations. So, for example, an RH negative mother who gave birth to an RH positive fetus. Okay, so we need this to prevent hemolytic disease of the newborn in the future. So this is what you call the rogue gum. Okay, limitation it is short lived. I mean, IgG will only protect you for 23 days. And at the same time, it can induce type 1 or type 3 hypersensitivity reaction, hypersensitivity reaction, especially if that particular antibodies came from animal serum, animal sera, such as the horse. Okay, so let's talk about the adaptive immunity. So when you say adaptive immunity, it is the transfers of cells of the immune system. So adaptive immunity is being performed to increase cell-mediated immunity. So treatment of cancer patients, with two more infiltrating lymphocytes activated in vitro. So also, it is being used for the transplantation of hematopoietic stem cells into patients with immuno, okay? So that is adoptive immunity. So again, this is the summary of our lesson. You may want to screenshot this. Okay, so there you have it. I hope that you like our lesson on immunization. Okay, so if you have any question, feel free to message me and do not forget to read your book. Stay safe. God bless everyone. This has been Dr. Supachai Basit. Bye!